Moving on to part two, we have Maltese myth and legend, climate change, and the early goddess period. This beautiful work is done by Maltese artist Jenny Caruana, and she we use her words during this presentation as well as her absolutely beautiful work. This is a multimedia creation, and we'll discuss it further. Uh, the Maltese people oh, and their lore, whoops, I'm sorry, did somebody need to say something? I just wanted to say that that's beautiful. Oh, thank, thank you. That's actually from Tarjean, the site that's above the hypogeum, and mm -hmm. I thought it was spectacular. And it's, I just happened to have that with it, but it's a, the Maltese mystery was why on these tiny islands did the unique culture of the temple builders emerge approximately 4500 BCE, before Stonehenge, the pyramids of Egypt, and overlapping the Mesopotamian culture, probably older, but obviously we just keep dis discovering that all these cultures go back much further than we thought. And this is the local legend uh, among the people on Malta: is that they were the east, they were the sacred mountain peaks of eastern Atlantis, and con and contain clues to their wisdom. Now, as I said, I have no evidence for these beliefs or against them, but the journey of exploring the genius of these brilliant builders, the astronomers, and the acoustical experts is one that I love sharing with people like you. Uh, possibly the term Atlantis, this is sort of how I look at it, applies to all ancient knowledge hidden in plain sight, or, you know, our planet has climate change, just like we were talking about, thus memories of underworlds, fire and ice, that whole idea. So. The, the spirals seem to occur in so many different places, don't they? We even have local sort of instances of that in our tumuli. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm curious about the spirals because the spirals appear on an awful lot of megalithic structures. Maybe not quite this um, clear and dramatic, but no matter whether it's uh, Native American, Mayan, um, other sites all over uh, what is now Asia and Europe, Mm -hmm. The spirals appear in an awful lot of places. Is there any interpretation of what the spirals mean? Um, Andrew, are you aware of any they're applying here? Because obviously, I think we know of some and we can discuss them. Well, I mean, there are many theories about what those spirals mean. I think we have to look at when in time we're talking about. And for the date that the archaeologists give these sites, and uh, we'll talk about, there are a few in Turkey that are older, just as for oh, areas that are nearer, say, than South America, right, mm -hmm. um, to here in Malta. It could have been part of the, um, the prehistoric mother goddess culture. Some people believe that the spiral is the spiral of life relating to the goddess culture itself. So. That's one explanation that's been given for them in this area. Debbie, this uh -huh. is Lisa. Yes, Lisa, please. Um, I, I understand that some of the spirals, the inner, uh, like where it begins, actually can align with a winter solstice, and then the outer uh, point of that spiral, usually done clockwise, because that's the way that the sun goes that that would be of the summer solstice, so the height, and then it goes back, you know, like, so summer to winter, it starts traveling back inward, and then it goes outward. Mm, sure. So mm. it may even align. That's so interesting. I just wanted to, like, throw that out there for people that want to look at that. I know that the one in uh, New Mexico aligns. I okay. don't know about ones in uh, Ireland or... New Grange or or Malta for that matter. So, but I, it's something to look at. Oh, definitely. I'm I'm lucky enough to be going to a conference on Malta at the end of September. And nice. when I started looking at the program there, I'm going I'm dumbfounded because it is a, an archaeo astronomers conference, and they are discovering. I mean, they're just constantly mm. discovering new things. That's why I almost stammer mm. when it comes to the age of something or when something happened, or, or even the source of it, simply because it keeps getting older and older and older mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as we look back, as Andrea knows, she, she's visited Gobekli Tepe, which is, I think, at one of the oldest sites, if not the oldest site we're aware of right now, that, that appears that yeah. it could be a, an out, uh, you know, not only an astronomical site, but a temple trip when Andrea, and um, 
these are the what they call the cart ruts. And um, I just had this as a question. This is uh, carrying the twin energies of the creative wisdom of the universe through the minds of our ancestors from ancient times, the cart ruts of Malta that extend under the water to Sicily and apparently beyond is what these actually reflect. And it's, um, is, is that some way they were using the power that Francis finds on his islands? And all of us, I think, who went there just felt this. In, is there anyone else? Yeah, I have a comment. Sure, Don. Um, I'd like to get you back on again here. <laughs> uh, the melting of the glaciers occurred some nine about nine thousand BCE, mm -hmm. and that's when the uh, Mediterranean was completely flooded, came through the rocks of Gibraltar. I'm just wondering if some of these ruts and such might have been cut prior to the time that the Mediterranean was flooded. Is that a possibility? That's one of the theories. Yeah, that's one of the theories that I've read. There's a Russian. Archaeologist, Debbie, you may remember this from our Egypt Peru group. We discussed it on there at length one time on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember his name, but I can provide Debbie with a link and she can give it to you later if, if you're interested. Um, he has come up, his theory is that yes, um, some of them could have been that old and some of them could have also been formed um, during the time of Flood. In fact, he thinks more of them were, were formed once the islands were flooded and the inhabitants were trying to escape to the higher areas. The limestone that's on Malta, there's two, two kinds, the coralline and the globigerina. The coralline is actually the harder. But his theory is that at that time it was softer and it had not hardened at all. That, you know, that happened through time and also because of weathering and the water, et cetera. But at the time that the cart ruts were made, they were not carts. He believes they were sledges. And he goes into great detail, as a scientist would, about why a sledge would make the rut much differently than a cart would and shows the different examples to prove that, to my mind. Uh, so that there were sledges that were being pulled by people. And actually, there are some photographs in his particular um, uh, essay where there are footprints next to the rut. So it could have been people pulling the sledges through the softer coralline limestone. Uh, some go uphill, some go downhill. Um, as Debbie has mentioned, there, there are many different uh, types of the, uh, sorry, the depth of the rut, the, the widths of them vary. Uh, some run over others, some run straight, and some turn uh, as you know, a person pulling something would have turned. At any rate, um, so his theory is that some could have been created before, and but most he thinks were created after, and they they were done by people pulling sledges. Um, Terry, did you find certain things like that going on, or uh, I I haven't seen these, but mm -hmm. uh, but you know what, the Oregon Trail much more recent, has ruts uh, in limestone that still look a lot like that. Oh, do they? Yeah, uh -huh. that, that could in, be then. Yeah, Yeah, in, uh, oh, eastern Washington? No, eastern Oregon. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So they can wear that much. Now, water would run through them and dig them deeper. So um, mm -hmm. that does seem like a possibility. So, you know, possibly that's it. What's interesting, I'll go to the next one, um, is that here's Before some... You do, Debbie, um, yeah, let me go back. There we go. Yes, Ange? Sorry, I was just going to say that there was a, a, a... Sorry, there was a thing on TV recently that said that um, they'd found some deep sort of tracks in the ground they thought were caused by the Ice Age, the end of the Ice Age, but where these occurred was just pointing directly at the place they decided to build Stonehenge. <laughs> and I think the reason they cited it where they did was because of these tracks. Interesting. Huh. <laughs> that is fascinating. Well, that's and that's good to know. Now that I now I have something else to learn about the Oregon Trail that it can do this. I'm I'm just wondering because I you know since everything sort of carries energy and obviously for transporting things we're carrying energy. Maybe that just appears and imprints just like Jenny the artist was talking about. You know, emotion being imprinted on uh, on a, a place. Um, I just, 
from my point of view, what I keep seeing in history is that while we've been essentially taught that history is linear and that we just keep getting greater and better and we know more now than humans ever did, and from we probably know differently, but from my point of view, from what I could see of history, it's very cyc cyclical and that basically we go through cycles and because of our, it's kind of like the breath of our long, long breath of our planet, we have the warming periods and the cold periods and different events taking place and those cycles um, seem to circle back around, basically like the, the Indians refer to as the yugas where they actually have a set time. Uh, where they the yugas circle back around and you go through the different ages. The Greeks also had the the same thing where they um, had that cycles of time. I think um, I think very possibly there are cycles of time, and I think in current in today's world, uh, those of us that are um, in developed countries are so technology focused that we've lost a lot of the other connections that we used to have. Same same feeling I have, and I think same feeling as Angie's dog. I think also, Debbie, they knew, because we're talking about long enough ago that they, to my mind, these are much older sites than archaeology dates them. And if we talk about, you know, they were the mountaintop, uh, they were the, the islands that we have now, we only have the mountaintop of other islands were there at the time of Atlantis, which I firmly believe in. Mm -hmm. And so when the water poured in through the Straits of Gibraltar and filled up the Mediterranean, and these became just the top of this great civilization. And it could have been in a former processional age, actually. It could be more than 10,000 years, 10,500 years ago, before, you know, pre-flood. And consciousness on the planet was higher then. If we look at it through the lens of the Yugas from the Hindu tradition, uh, it was a much higher time, a different yuga than according to that tradition that we're in now. Just coming out of the Dark Ages, the Kali Yuga, moving into the Dwapara Yuga. But at that time, it was either the Golden Age of the Satcha Yuga or the Treta Yuga just winding down a little bit from it. So they knew what about the cycles of time, and they knew that cataclysms happened, and they knew that only the stones survive. Writings are not going to survive on paper. Metal is not going to survive. Wood is not going to survive. What is going to survive? The stone. So I think malt is an excellent example of what they put in the stones that we have now. And putting in means also those uh, alignments that you're referring to, you know, the astronomical alignments. So that, that's their way of telling us what was going on back then, and if we look at it, and you're much more knowledgeable than me about that, through the different astronomical alignments through time, they're also telling us what's going to happen in the future. And this thing at the bottom is what most of the people from during the last ice age and later would have viewed because they lived in the south-facing caves in the northern hemisphere. So they would have been watching the planets move across the sky just as she's drawn it in this um, drawing here with that sort of arched triangular shape and then then you look up at Taurus and uh, this this was from Lascaux Cave which is 17,000 last they've said is 17,300 years old they're estimating now and you literally see the V of the horns of the bull the, the sacred bull, you see in the face of the bull, it isn't as clear in this cave painting copy, but it's, it's, it forms a V. If you happen to look up at the constellation of Taurus in the sky, you see this distinct V in the sky. And above that, if you see that, you see that circle of six, well, it's not quite a circle, it's sort of an elongated, uh, but the six stars grouped together. Um, that is a Pleiades. It's considered to be in the shoulder of the bull. Back half of the bull we don't have in the sky. It's, it seems to be submerged which I find really interesting, like, uh, and that being the goddess part. And then that's the belt of Orion. If you look at those three, it looks like three dots and then an, um, so I don't know if that was supposed to be another dot, meaning there were four stars in the belt of Orion at one point, or whether 
that was a symbol of of a count of some time kind, like a lunar count at that point. Uh, it's hard to tell which, but but what's interesting is it does point that belt of Orion points to the Pleiades, you know, through Taurus, and then it points back down to the star Sirius, which was the goddess star in Egypt, the um, uh, star in Canis Major that um, w you know represents her and the loyal feminine principle. So, you know, if we have any comments there, and that Gardalum definitely faces that direction. The, where uh, this was a, a photograph I thought was beautiful that Francis took of the equinox sunrise. It was a hazy day in Malta. I think that was in 2013. But he took the sun and that hazy picture through that V, sort of V, the feminine V-shape, delta shape uh, in the rocks. And then this is just another, uh, not just, it's another beautiful painting from uh, Jenny Kairana. Um, this was called Oracle. And this was another one of her, you know, average women being the oracles in the temple and how they might have been imprinted in time on the walls, which I think is really beautiful. So this chronology is from the Heritage Malta books that are available at the various ancient site. No, we know more, but Ardalam was actually 5200 to 4500 BCE. And then we had the Scorba period, uh, 40, roughly 4500 to 4100 BCE. And obviously things don't just neatly change like that either, so we're having overlapping in time. Uh, then we get into the Imjar period. Jigantia, which we'll get into shortly, was 3600 to 3000 BCE. And then the Safliani period was it's the Hal Safliani hypogeum. So that's all in that Safliani Targene period from 3300 all the way down to 2500 uh, BCE. And then we got into the Bronze Age later, where 2500 to 1500, which took in the Minoan period, when they seem to have had a, an influence there. Now, he, this here is uh, Ardalam uh, Cave in Malta. And um, they they found very ancient bones of, of extinct animals, uh, but it seems to have also been a place where it was a during the goddess cultures a, a place where they would go, and that as, as we said had the view to the of the planets and the stars passing over the horizon to the south, and but the just a lot of ceremonies it looks like they took place, and I just happened to include uh, this stalactite from another ancient cave that much older from the ice age period where you can see the bull i don't know if you how well you can see it but there's the bull's face etched and you can sort of see the horns and below that is the mm -hmm. feminine v and it goes down like the like a, a another feminine v shape which i thought was really beautiful um and then we'll um we'll move on this is the scorba period the oops sorry about that we'll have to move that back accidentally touched something and this was 6500 to 5600 years ago quite quite old and there they haven't done a lot of it is missing and they they haven't done as much restoration on it but i noticed our artist uh jenny did manage to really get she said she loved the energy at the scorba sites and this is her painting scorba burns which i thought was beautiful and it did i have those senses when i go to these places of certain you know you see the colors and feel the the spirals or the the swirling energies around you and it's so intense in these places this i i love this is gigantia now you can see that this that this temple is in pretty remarkable shape and um this is an aerial shot of it with those beautiful rolling hills there are three main hills um on the island of gozo and that's the feminine island and this is the the myth there was that a giant goddess came and built this temple and built the other temples. And I just happened to love this photograph a friend of mine, an artist, took uh, at the Getty Museum. And I thought that was such a beautiful example of being in the mother's arms. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can see how fascinated the little boy was with the, the, with the puppeteer uh, at the Getty. But... Uh, I, I just, these temples are so beautiful, and we'll be looking a little more at Gigantia as we go along here. This is, um, it was like mother-sister-daughter temples there, and 
the this figurine was found uh, in near it was actually near there it's the area where it is uh, where the Gigantia temple is and the one sister that you sort of see on the left you'll see the different views going by she's holding a baby and the other sister is holding the chalice of life and at their feet now this was the determination of Maria Gambudas periods and, and study all those from a mythic point of view but she was she was referring to this red ochre you that you see and that was to be the below their skirts and that was uh, determined by her to be the menstrual blood of life the, that carries on and the round goddess shapes are reflected in the temples and I just thought it was funny because we always talk about the bee goddesses and I realized that it's also the shape of a bee and um, let, and the Minoans did celebrate the bee goddess. So, and the pleats and the skirts uh, do have a certain, the counts have a meaning as far as uh, different cycles in time and, and at cycles of goddess cycles in the sky as well. So, um, just to point that out. And then I'm bringing some of them together. Here's the hypogeum uh, dreaming goddesses at the top, which I think are just beautiful. You know, it's the, the roundness and the, the fullness of life to me it's like being to me it's like being full of the love energy being full of the energy of life being full of the energy of nurturing and feeding humanity and that was their I think sense of the great goddess and uh, Picasso was looking at some of the Ice Age goddesses and in spite that piece on the top left was uh, one of his pieces that was inspired by that and then I loved the um, the Rivera one here again with the very round shape of the woman making the food and this was a this other was another site we'll study at the end the Hajarim and M. Nidra the last ones we'll cover but you can see that they all had this rounded goddess feeling and you see once again the the red beneath the skirts from the red ochre that was reflective and on her feet it isn't quite as visible on her feet but the the menstrual blood of life that they celebrated so pretty amazing stuff and Yes, please. So I was curious too, could these temples have been like, I mean, there, there's obviously the fertility aspect all encompassing here. So do you think it was a place for women during their cycle and also could have been a place for fertility, you know, for, you I know, think, in terms of having children? Um, I think a, a lot of people, and, and Maria Gambudis in particular, um, promotes that idea and I the ancient goddess cultures and I certainly view it that way it just seems so predominant all around the world that yes I would I would view it as that any other comments by anyone yeah it's it's pretty spectacular when they think of it but I think those sites were considered and like we said whether they were sites of sexual union where people created sacred little people and uh, but also dreaming chambers. I think there are a lot of people who think that pregnant women, I know there, there's quite a bit of theory about that, the pregnant women were in the hypogeum in the dreaming chambers um, during their pregnancy. You know, they would be down there, obviously, impacting the children, and I'll go into that a little bit more later as well. Um, this, These are some of the chambers that were there that were uh, so beautiful, and this is one of the symbols that was found, the, the fish looking symbol and um, this was the cave this is the cave that's um, adjacent to it the and I, I make reference later to the duende which is a Spanish term that we'll go into a little bit but it's the riches of the earth speaking at Gigantia where they bring the three muses the three goddesses together to speak to us um, and what I loved about this one really thrilled me because when I just found this yesterday um, in Jenny's work and those were the exact colors that I saw when I went to Gigantia <laughs> when I was in the site mm -hmm. just these rolling it was like a rolling mist of beautiful blues and roses and uh, that just felt like a nurturing nourishing feeling or energy there and uh, actually thinking in terms of the earth as a goddess itself and which is an odd thing to say because were they aware at that point in time that the earth was round <laughs> that is a thought and 
I wouldn't be surprised since they actually were navigating then, you know, we, as we find, I, mm -hmm. I think it makes sense to us. We don't have a lot of proof of these things, but I think it really makes a tremendous amount of sense. And yeah, I, I always saw those egg shapes in the, you know, it's just this richness and bountiful. And when you feel filled up with love for someone, you feel like that, you know, you feel that big filled up shape. And um, this was, I was quoting um, on this one, Federico Garcia Lorca, who I, one of the poets I really like. He and Pablo Neruda were friends, and Pablo Neruda is my favorite poet. And uh, he speaks of what artists use. And so I was referring to this triple goddess because he speaks of the muse as the first. The muse remains motionless. She can have a finely pleated tunic or cow eyes like those which gaze out in Pompeii. At the four-sided nose, her great friend Picasso has painted her with. The angel can disturb Ant Antonello de Messina's heads of hair, Lippi's tunics, or the violins of Mussolini or Rousseau. Yet, and then he speaks of the duende. That was what I was speaking of coming from the cave. And he says, where is the duende? Through the empty archway, a wind of the, seven, of the spirit enters, blowing insistently over the heads of the dead. In search of new landscapes and unknown accents, a wind with the odor of a child's saliva, crushed grass, and Medusa's veil, announcing the endless baptism of freshly created things. I just thought that was such a beautiful description mm. of uh, creation. And um, poets uh, do say it well, don't they? <laughs> and this painting... The right, the right words. Sorry, the right words in the right order is the definition of poetry, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something I don't master nearly as well as they do, <laughs> but I love the I suppose, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say. I suppose you could you could say the breath of life and get it in three words, but it is it's beautifully put. Yeah. He well, he goes on actually about the duende on page after page, which is rather interesting mm. uh, and lovely. I just took an excerpt, but this and this painting is called Vortex. I forgot to mention that, which really describes it well and then she this is also one of hers the the legs of the goddess and this one is from Targine which we'll look at later giant they're very large beautiful um looks like I'm gonna have to click back in here uh then just the same feeling here this is Gozo again and here's one of the Our Lady churches that was uh built on the top of one of the sacred hills and I must say when I got to the top of that hill it was that same overwhelming feeling of just this grace and beauty and while I was visiting that um, it was funny because a man from that particular cathedral came up to me and started telling me a story about how it was Pope John Paul uh, was flying I think to somewhere in Africa and he had left Rome and one of the engines caught on fire and they had to land and he said could we please land on Malta? I want to go to, the, and they wanted to go to this, he wanted to go to the specific uh, cathedral on Gozo. So he, he did, and he visited. And it's really, I mean, obviously, he was loving that energy too, you know, the, of the, the loving goddess and, and the nurturing spirit. And it carries through whatever religion, obviously. I mean, religions, I, I don't always, I'm not always mad about the dogma that they have, but, um, uh, and how people argue and hate each other over the differences in religion, but I do um, notice that there's that common thread of the, the reverence that we all have, and it and it is like mother love. And I just thought this the Azure window here was such a such a stunning place, and it's another one of their sites that is so beautiful. And this statue was actually found in Gigantia, and it looks like I'm wondering if that was like an offering plate or something on her head, or if it was had some other symbol like a receiving sort of hat or something of energies since that would be the crown chakra. Um, just some interesting thoughts. We don't know, but it's fun to explore. And um, let me go on to some more. I thought this was beautiful. This is um, another photograph that Francis took. And it was a woman, the soprano Miriam uh, Kaushi, I don't know how you pronounce it exactly, singing Il Gigantia for the summer solstice in 2013 at the site. And I thought when there's the moon above her, the full moon, I thought that was just such a beautiful figure. And it's once again the voices carrying. And uh, out of that same cathedral that I just showed with the Our Lady paint, you know, mosaic, there were beautiful mosaics in there, the Phoenix Rising at Gozo, um, Our Lady Cathedral, 
and then you can see that it what an interesting thing it has we can see the flames coming up and all these pillars of course have all the sacred symbols and you see that that one that looks sort of like a snowflake as well as a cross that as you said the music can form those shapes um, mm -hmm.